Pick and mix for better communication. We live in a world where disinformation is a fact of life. We have unprecedented amounts of data being created every day, all at our fingertips, but with competing narratives on how that data is interpreted. How did we get here? What can we do to get to the reality of these stories that we see? And how can we become effective communicators of what we find? My answer is threefold. We need to examine our sources, look from multiple different angles, and challenge our own inherent assumptions. On the 27th of October 2020, the Woolworths UK Twitter account proudly announced that the retailer was making its way back to the high street after a long time away. For many, this was the good news that 2020 was missing all along, and the social media platform rejoiced in collective nostalgia. The Metro, the Daily Star, the Sun, the Mirror, Mail, and even Sky News, the Brighton Argus, and Birmingham Live swooped on the news and ran the story even though later that afternoon it turned out to be a hoax. Twelve hours later, the account was formally shut down. The operation had been devised by a sixth form student in York who wants to remain anonymous for fear of retribution from disappointed Pig and Mix fans. They even admitted purposefully injecting typos into the tweets, but various news outlets picked up the story anyway. Even the lack of a website didn't deter them. What the newspapers needed were the clicks, the engagement, the sensation. The Woolworths example is merely the latest in a long series of plausible but ultimately misleading news, and is, on the face of it, relatively benign. We may not like it, but we do now live in a world of deep fake videos, photoshopping as standard, and even the words that we hear recorded can be edited using something akin to a word processor. But we must remember that competing narratives, fake news and lies circulated as truth have very real and sometimes devastating effects on people and their families, as can be seen across the globe right now. So how did we get to a situation where the media cares more about the sensation, the clicks, than whether or not the reporters are valid accurate rendition of the event. When did the news become entertainment? You may have heard the journalism maxim from Jonathan Foster at Sheffield University. If someone says it's raining and another person says it's dry, it's not your job to quote them both. Your job is to look out of the window and find out which is true. One could perhaps point fingers towards social media, but I think it goes further back than that. Its seeds being sown, for example, in the advent of television news. The written word has a level of verifiability, deliberation and active thought that pictures and videos do not. A picture may paint a thousand words, but who gets to insinuate those words in our minds? A television can be glanced at in a way that a newspaper cannot, and over time a proportion of the population has become more used to sound bites, slogans and buzzwords than in-depth reporting and carefully constructed inquiry. Before the digital age, one used to buy a newspaper, which helped to keep the reporting going. Advertising crept in as a way to top that money up and ensure their smooth ongoing running. As things have moved on, however, and people can access their news online for free, the revenues from users buying digital subscriptions and physical copies have declined and advertising has necessarily increased. This means, however, that we are not paying with our money, but with our attention, in the attention economy. The attention economy is an economy that relies upon the power of these curated advertisements to direct the attention of our minds towards purchasing behaviours that will in turn increase the flow of funds into the website. For this to happen, adverts need to be produced and positioned carefully in such a way that the maximum number of users will view them and consume the material and stay on the site longer for more exposure. This, of course, turns the goal of the website away from accuracy towards attracting users, and so the quality of the reporting in places deteriorates to sound bites and slogans. But it is the excitement generated that counts, as that keeps pushing the traffic towards the site. We can see the results with the Woolworths debacle, but we've seen it before. Politicians positing a ludicrous idea 
as a distraction from some awkward report or unpopular bill, and the famous line widely misattributed to Alistair Campbell, it's a good day to bury bad news. The television era has weaned us onto accepting and expecting attention-grabbing pictures, so the attention economy has become more fine-tuned at delivering what we think we want even before we know we want it, by constantly collecting and correlating personal data in screens that live in our pockets. The attention economy has, after all, led us to the point where those who can provoke the strongest emotions will get promoted to the top of our feeds, where we are invited to like and share how much anger we are feeling, inviting others to do the same. Research published in the 2019 edition of the annual Reuters Institute Digital News Report showed that 35% of UK respondents actively avoid the news, up from 24% in 2017, with 55% of those surveyed worldwide concerned about their ability to discern what is fake and what is not online. This is no surprise. Research going back over 30 years has looked at the effect of high emotion on the brain's ability to reason. Intense emotional states are known to impair working memory capacity, hamper the brain's ability to organize and consider information, and to verify the validity of arguments. Thus, we have a problematic feedback loop going on within rolling feeds of anger, irrationality and sharing, a rage virus. We demand to know the provenance of our actual food. Is this chicken British? Were these vegetables grown locally? What other ingredients have been added? But perhaps we don't have quite the same rigour when it concerns our information intake, especially of less personal concern. For instance, when it involves the political situation that unfolds confusingly in the global arena. Questions concerning news reporting, motives, affiliations and editing processes can easily become secondary or occluded by the intake of a rich source of excitement that creates an emotional response rather than a rational deliberation. We may enjoy the excitement, we may find the buzz of that emotional stimulus useful, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's good to be able to see that this is what we're getting from the media. But if we want to go deeper, beyond the merely plausible, to be better prepared and more skilled at avoiding disinformation, then we can start by unhooking ourselves from social media and rolling news. After all, many of us have become used to the stream of excitement that comes from these, but like any such habit, it can be useful to break. A study in 2019 by Stanford University and New York University found that quitting Facebook for a month made users happier, increasing time spent offline with family and friends, and spending less time consuming news. It noted that, quote, four weeks without Facebook improves subjective well-being and substantially reduces post-experiment demand, suggesting that forces such as addiction and projection bias may cause people to use Facebook more than they otherwise would, end quote. Social media is designed to give us a buzz, then keep us addicted. It's no wonder, therefore, that doom-scrolling has entered our everyday vocabulary and that more and more people are becoming emotionally exhausted by the constant barrage. It may be that complete disconnection is the answer. That would certainly seem to provide some welcome respite, but it doesn't help us to become better communicators of truth for those around us. In order to provide a counterpoint to the media, we still need to be informed ourselves, and if we are to identify what is truthful and useful, we first need to disengage with the immediate and sensational effect of rolling news. We need to have attention available to be able to devote resources to discovering what is trustworthy and what is not. If we are still responding emotionally to the news feed, then we might not have the mental space to look for the truth within it. Try to spend a month off social media and see how your mood changes. You may find, like the respondents in the study mentioned earlier, that you have more energy or are generally happier. We may discover that the addictive nature of the rolling media and the emotion buzz it creates has been wearing us down with the constant jolts of adrenaline and notifications. Then, once we have started to reclaim those personal resources, we may want to find the time to explore our responses to events. 
perhaps with questions such as, how do I respond to something? Why do I choose this news source over another? Do I avoid certain topics? The more we know about ourselves and our own emotional responses or cravings, the more we might get closer to understanding the intellectual bias that such emotionalism produces. Over time, should we find this process liberating, then we might also find that we have weaned from emotionalism towards an enjoyment of truth-finding. Furthermore, we might also find that we have become better at discerning the truth in what we hear, see and read. We may know the truth about a shop that's been defunct for 12 years now, but who knows what piece of exciting storytelling will cross your feeds next, looking entirely plausible. The world needs people who can find and communicate the truth clearly and coherently. And if we want to be one of those communicators, then we can start here. There is a scientific principle called parallax, which is used everywhere from video games to measuring the distances to local stars. It can be demonstrated very simply by holding a finger up about six inches from your face, then closing one eye and then the other. You will see that your finger, which is close to you, seems to move with respect to what's behind it. This is what creates our depth perception, as background objects don't move as much as foreground ones, just like with your finger moving against the more stationary background. For local stars, we don't close our eyes, but we take a measurement, then wait until we've travelled to the other side of the sun six months later to take the next one, and thus perform the calculations. We can do the same sort of calculation with the news. When faced with multiple sources of varying authenticity, we could look at a particular story from those multiple viewpoints to understand what the heart of the matter actually is. The more differing sources we view over varying lengths of time, the more we can take off the layers of opinion and hype. It is a pick-and-mix approach for identifying what is attention-grabbing hype and what are the facts. Sometimes we won't get to see that until six months later, as with stellar distances, but rationality needs to be unhooked from the immediate, knee-jerk reaction of the emotional pull of rolling news. So if we are to be good communicators for those around us, discerning the truth and transmitting that clearly, we should remember three things. One, attention is currency. Reclaim our attention by turning off the scrolling which will then allow us to investigate things properly. Two, multiple differing viewpoints allow us to see what is at the heart of a particular topic of interest. And three, understanding ourselves is key to being an effective communicator for others. Once we've started to bring that awareness to ourselves, we can then return to the media with a better understanding of how we react, whether it's enjoying the excitement or wanting greater clarity. We can then use a discerning approach to choose our sources carefully and use parallax to understand what is being said to then be able to communicate how we wish. But if we are to dive past the merely plausible, we need to be prepared. This is my message for the future as we wade further into the dark sea of disinformation, data and conflicting opinions. We can't turn this tide. Too many people have too much invested in keeping our attention as their way to make money and undermine our way of life. The future is in danger, and we may risk drowning in apathy and malaise, but we can equip ourselves with tools that we already have. It starts with unhooking from the stream, finding the time to prepare, then challenging and changing ourselves. Now is the time to use those tools and to begin to change the world.